Welcome back. This is part two of perinatal infections where we go over the torch infections and we will also talk about a couple additional lesions that we need to be aware of in, in uh, this period. So let's dive in. Let's continue on. Um, Zika virus. So Zika virus is known to be transmitted via the mosquito bites and also via sexual intercourse with infected individuals. So Zika virus is found most prevalently in Mexico, Central America, South America, and in the Caribbean, as well as parts of Southeast Asia, Oceania, and part of Africa. Now, there have been reports of spread in here in the U.S., uh, specifically Texas and Florida, but generally patients at risk for Zika virus infection during pregnancy are those who have traveled to an endemic area. Now, the maternal signs of infection include fever, joint pain, maculopapular rash, and conjunctivitis. Now, in terms of the fetus, the most important congenital sign that's associated with Zika virus is microcephaly. However, ocular abnormalities, seizures, cranial dimorphisms, sensory neural hearing loss, neuromotor abnormalities, contractures, fetal growth restriction, and fetal loss may occur. So those are all important things to keep in mind. Now, neonates suspected of congenital Zika syndrome should have neuroimaging performed with either a CT or an MRI of the head. Findings consistent with the disease include intracranial calcifications, cortical abnormalities, and ventricular megaly. Now, to make a diagnosis prior to birth, the maternal serum can be tested using RT-PCR for Zika virus and Zika virus IgM serology. Then after birth, the neonate should have the same analysis performed within two days of life. The treatment for congenital Zika syndrome is supportive care and routine management of complications like anti-seizure medications, physical therapy, etc., really just depends on what findings are present. All right, let's move on now to the R of the torch infections. This stands for rubella. Now, rubella is a preventable disease when the mother is vaccinated prior to pregnancy. This virus is transmitted transplacentally. The greatest risk of developing congenital rubella if contracted before 20 weeks gestation. Now, maternal symptoms of rubella include fever, coryza, conjunctivitis, sore throat, and cough. Now, the rash of rubella is an erythematous maculopapular rash, which may or may not be pruritic. The lymphadenopathy of rubella is generalized and it's tender. And classically, it is post-auricular, but suboccipital and cervical nodes can also be involved. Now, the polyarthralgias usually involve the hands, the wrists, the knees, and the ankles symmetrically and can include morning stiffness. Now, congenital signs and symptoms that you want to look out for are hearing loss, cataracts, heart defects such as a PDA and pulmonic stenosis, that classic blueberry muffin lesion, which uh, indicates cutaneous hematopoiesis, microcephaly, low birth weight, and intellectual disability. Labs that can diagnose congenital rubella include the presence of positive rubella-specific IgM antibodies, persistent rubella-specific IgG antibodies, meaning the antibodies are not decreasing in concentration or are higher than would be anticipated from passive transfer of maternal antibody or a positive viral culture and positive rubella virus uh, RNA-PCR. Now, treatment is with supportive care and management of individual complications. Now, moving on to the C in, torch, in the torch mnemonic, this stands for uh, cytomegalovirus, which can be transmitted to the pregnant patient via person-to-person -person contact sexual intercourse, or blood transfusions, or organ transplants. Now, patients can be asymptomatic, or they may present with pharyngitis, rhinitis, or a rash. Now, the rash varies drastically from patient to patient, but it could be maculopapular, it could be macular, it could be papular, uh, it could be more biliform. So there's not one distinct type of rash that you're going to expect here. Patients may also have myalgias, arthralgias, or headaches. Fetal infection occurs via transplacental transmission or via postnatal infection when exposed to cervical or vaginal viral shedding at birth, or it can happen via exposure through infected breast milk. But this much more frequently results in very mild disease without complications. Now, the congenital signs and symptoms of CMV are going to include sensory neural hearing loss, and it's important to remember that congenital cytomegalovirus infection is the most common cause of non-hereditary sensory neural hearing loss. Additionally, look for hepatosplenomegaly, jaundice, petechia, microcephaly, small size for gestational age, vision impairment, seizures, and or intellectual disability. All of these may be present. Now, as you'd expect, given some of those symptoms, some lab findings that you'll see in congenital CMV include elevated direct and indirect serum bilirubin. This can cause jaundice. 
thrombocytopenia, which can present with petechia, um, hepatosplenomegaly, which can present with elevated transaminases, as well as hemolytic anemia. On imaging, a large variety of defects can be present in the brain, including intracranial calcifications, lenticulostrite vas uh, vasculopathy, ventriculomegaly, and or white matter disease. Now, the diagnosis is made with viral culture or PCR of CMV from neonatal urine within three weeks of birth or prior to birth via amniotic fluid viral culture or CMV DNA or even CMV IgM antibody in fetal blood. But obviously, these will come with an elevated risk of fetal demise with testing, especially when we're sampling fetal blood. Now, the treatment for CMV is reserved for those neonates with evidence of end-organ symptoms. So receiving gancyclovir if symptoms are life-threatening or valgancyclovir if they are non-life-threatening. All right, the final H is herpes simplex virus. This is most often transmitted to the neonate in the perinatal period. It's pretty rare for an intrauterine infection of the fetus to occur with HSV. Now, it's mostly during delivery that either the pregnant patient has symptomatic or asymptomatic disease, and the neonate is infected as they pass through that genital tract. Then finally, about 10% of HSV infections occur postnatally when a caretaker with an active HSV infection cares for the neonate. Now, neonatal herpes simplex virus signs and symptoms are broken into three kind of manifestations. The first is skin, eye, and mouth disease. So neonates can develop typical skin lesions that are associated with HSV. Remember, that includes clusters of vesicular lesions with an erythematous base. The eye disease begins as conjunctival erythema and excessive watering and can progress to cataracts and chorioretinitis if it's not promptly treated. Oral ulcers can be located on the tongue, the palate, and mucosal lining of the mouth. Now, the second way neonatal HSV can present is as a CNS infection. So along with this, patients may also have skin, eye, and mouth disease, or these symptoms can be absent. Now, the CNS infections can result in agitation, lethargy, poor feeding, fever, tremors, full anterior fontanelle, and either focal or generalized seizures. And finally, neonatal HSV can cause disseminated disease and end organ damage. So infecting nearly any organ system is possible. So the heart can be infected causing myocarditis, the lungs causing pneumonia, hemorrhagic pneumonia, uh, pneumonitis, kidney diseases, hepatitis, anything really. Okay, keep that in mind. Now the patient can have a variety of lab abnormalities depending on whether the patient has skin eye mouth disease, CNS disease, or disseminated disease. Now, some abnormalities that we want to look out for with the disseminated disease include elevated liver transaminases, direct hyperbilirubinemia, labs indicating DIC, thrombocytopenia, and or neutropenia. CNS infections can be identified via CSF analysis with findings including low normal glucose levels, mononuclear cell pleocytosis, mildly elevated protein, and positive HSV DNA PCR. Initially, the imaging studies may be normal, but after days to weeks of having the disease, a CT or MRI of the head may show destructive lesions involving multiple areas of the brain, parenchymal brain edema, and or hemorrhage. Now, the diagnosis is technically slightly different for each different type. In the skin eye mouth disease, the patient will have any of the symptoms we discussed without CNS or end organ involvement, and either isolation of HSV in surface cultures, positive HSV DNA PCR in the blood or plasma, or of HSV in skin lesion scrapings by rapid direct immunofluorescent assays. In the CNS disease, a positive CSF HSV DNA PCR or clinical symptoms of CNS involvement plus isolation of HSV in surface cultures or positive HSV DNA PCR in the blood or plasma is enough to make your diagnosis. And then in our disseminated disease, clinical signs of systemic involvement plus isolation of HSV in surface cultures, positive HSV DNA PCR in the blood or plasma, HSV and skin lesion scrapings by rapid direct immunofluorescence assays, or positive CS, CSF HSV DNA PCR. Just one of those labs would be needed to confirm HSV presence, causing disseminated disease. Now, IV acyclovir is used to treat all manifestations of neonatal HSV from the skin eye mouth disease all the way to disseminated diseases. All right, let's do some content review questions. Here is your first one. I will put 20 seconds on the clock if you need more time. Hit that pause button, figure this out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is C.
Next question, 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, you guys know what to do. Correct answer here is A. Last question, I will put 20 seconds on the clock. Come on back when you got the right answer. The correct answer here is B. All right, that concludes part two of perinatal infections. I will see you guys on the next lecture.